Are or were you a Bible college student? If so, was your experience in Bible college like my own? After you view this video, feel free to let me know in the comment section. Hi, I'm David Daniels from Chick Publications. When I came to Bible college, I wanted to serve my Lord 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just like I still do now. I am so totally blessed. Anyway, when I came to Bible college in February 1981, Pacific Christian College was all about one goal. And right away in class, they stated that goal to equip servant leaders to disciple the nations. It was talked about everywhere and even painted on a central wall. One of the scriptures they focused on was the Great Commission found in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Here it is the right way in the King James Bible. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. My teacher said, in the original Greek, it doesn't say go. It says going, as in while you are going. Then they said that the next words should be translated make disciples of all nations, not teach all nations. They taught us that the King James word teach was wrong. They taught us that the King James Bible was an all right translation for those days, but now, in the light of modern scientific research, their translation just doesn't measure up. But they didn't stop there. Over time, my professors ridiculed the King James, even at times when I would check, and one or more of their favorite versions said the very same thing. Somehow only the King James was to blame. The others were just alternate readings. What was going on here? As I've told you before, my teacher said that all translations are 99 and two-thirds percent the same, and yet somehow the King James was simply awful, horrible, no good, very bad, and something no one should read in this day and age. My Greek professor even called it criminal. Did you have the same experience I had? And if not in Bible college, maybe in your study group or even in a church service? It's pretty widespread, and this was going on in the 1980s. But now, let me answer the question. Should the King James have said what the modern scholars and Bibles say, or are the King James words actually correct? Full disclosure, I was a top student in New Testament Greek at Bible College, and I passed straight into Advanced Greek at Fuller Seminary. In addition, I studied linguistics with S.I.L. Wycliffe and continued studying manuscripts of various kinds right up to today. And right now, of course, the modern fake, this is at Quidditch Sunny Eticus. I'm not ignorant about the Greek. Our advanced Greek course at Fuller was focused on seeing how people will teach a rule of Greek, but then they'll quickly break it whenever the scripture gets in the way of their personal theology. For instance, when we went over Matthew 28, 19, the truth is, you don't simply translate a Greek participle by adding an ing to a verb. When you do that in English, you can wrongly change the meaning of a word or even an entire doctrine like being saved in 1 Corinthians 1.18. There's a reason why it says go in the King James, and most Bibles for that matter. It's because that big word poriuthentes in that context simply means go. But what about make disciples? Why do modern versions change it from the simple King James word, teach? Let's think this one through. How do you make someone a disciple? If a disciple is a student, a learner, how do you make him or her learn? You've heard the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Well, you can lead a student to your classroom, but you can't make him think either. But there are things we can do. That's where how we teach comes in. 
With a horse, we can offer it salt. If the horse licks the salt, it will become thirsty and want the water. Then he'll probably drink, problem solved. If I teach well enough and excite the student with the right questions, he or she might actually want to learn. The command, make disciples, misses the whole point. God told us to teach and preach. That's our responsibility. We are not in charge of their response. That's their response ability. We cannot make disciples any more than we can make people saved. It's an impossible task for any human being. But we can teach. And we can preach the word, providing them with God's offer of forgiveness of their sins and eternal life if they will trust the shed blood of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to pay for their sins. Again, that is our responsibility. And translations and teachings that change those words are simply irresponsible. You know what the last 36 years of study have shown me? They've shown me how the words were already translated correctly in English in the King James Bible. We are to go, teach all nations, baptizing them, and here's what to teach from verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. How do we do that? Take another Greek class? Praise God, no, we have the scriptures. But the modern professors will tell us the scriptures in our hands are not enough. No, we'd have to trust a man to tell us what God really said. And you know how they do it? They tell us, you cannot understand the Bible until you know the original Greek. Sometimes even preachers do this. They say we must learn the ancient, holy, original Greek. And then that will unlock the true secrets of God in the Bible. You too can know the holy language of the ancients. You too can become a priest to your people. You know why? Because then you'll feel able to correct the Bible just like they do. The truth is, people who spend their time correcting the Bible have little time to learn the Bible. And why would they? They refuse to believe the Bible. They believe only the sacred secrets of the original Greek. A new Bible just came out promising to give secrets from the original Greek. It's so hypocritical. They tell us the King James English words of our own language are too hard for us. But then they push a 2,000-year-old, mostly dead language, Koine Greek, as if that's simpler. It's like someone who studies the Greek now has a special magic, just like the Catholic priests who learned Latin. But let's go back to the go and teach. Where did this going and make disciples come from? Not from the 1300s through the Reformation, Wycliffe, 1380s. Therefore go ye and teach all folks. Tyndale, 1534, go therefore and teach all nations. Cranmer, 1539, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Geneva, 1557, go therefore and teach all nations. Bishops, 1568, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. King James 1611, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Do you see? Through the centuries, these Bible believers knew it means go and teach. Going and make disciples, how did it change? First, it was the Jesuits who introduced in the Rames 1582 New Testament, going therefore, teach ye all nations. And guess what? It was, surprise, surprise, Westcott and Hort in the 1881 revised version that introduced, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations. God told us to teach, and we can only teach what we know, no more than we know after we know it. Don't go to the Greek to try to dig for nuggets. God placed them in his preserved words for all to see. There are two verses that tell us what to do with the words of God, and both of them were changed by modern scholars. Here they are in the King James. John 5.39, search the scriptures. 2 Timothy 
2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Search and study, then we can go and teach. But that can only happen if we first have a Bible we can believe. I do. Do you? God bless you and have a wonderful day.